Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So no matter where you all are joining us from today, I'm really happy to welcome you all here. I saw that we have close to 70 participants right now with some still trickling in uh, with the session. So it is really exciting to be able to be in front of such a large group that is connected to CTY to be able to talk a little bit about Hopkins. So I know that this presentation is falling really as a part of a series as you all will be hearing about a lot of different colleges and universities. But in a lot of ways, there is something special to be able to uh, hear a little bit more about the university. So to quickly introduce myself, my name is Juan de la Rosa Diaz. I'm an assistant director of admissions in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions at Johns Hopkins University. So one of the members of the admissions committee that as of just a couple of weeks ago has started the application reading process for this year. If ever you all attend events like college fairs or presentations in your high school, I or one of my many colleagues in our office will be the folks that are you know, visiting you all, talking to you all about Hopkins as an undergraduate institution. So it is really exciting to be here with you all, especially with that connection through the CTY program. To be able to introduce you all uh, to what we will be doing, give you all a heads up of the sort of structure that we'll have tonight. So this is really going to be meant to be an opportunity for you all to be able to hear from students directly and really put to life a lot of things that you all may already know about the university. So know that I will take about 10 to 15 minutes to talk just generally in broad strokes about Hopkins as an institution. But the majority of the time that we have together is going to be able is going to be dedicated, excuse me, to be able to hear from a few current students that we have on our panel today. So we have a panel format where we have a couple of questions that we have to be able to get the conversation started. But as questions are coming up, as we're, we're talking about anything that may be really unique or really special about the Hopkins experience, you all are more than welcome to use the Q&A to submit those questions. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have together. But without further ado, I can go ahead and get started. So like I said, we'll spend the next about you know, 10, 15 minutes talking a little bit about Hopkins. I know that you all are in one way or another, you know, connected through the CTY program to Hopkins. And some of you all might be really familiar with Hopkins as an undergraduate institution. Some of you all, you know, may have been a part of the CTY program on other campuses or virtually, and you may be less familiar with what our undergraduate programs look like here at the, at the, at the university. So I did just want to be able to sort of paint the picture of what the undergraduate student experience looks like in broad strokes here at Hopkins, and really be able to supplement that from what we'll hear from our panelists in just a bit. But to be able to get everyone on the same page, not only in terms of what Hopkins is as an institution and where we are. So to be able to introduce Johns Hopkins University, you all are really familiar with it, as we all know, a really massive university system that also includes a healthcare system and is the largest private employer in the state of Maryland. But within this system, as you all can see, we have a number of different schools, a number of different campuses where we have both undergraduate and graduate programs. In a lot of ways, our reputation precedes us when it comes to the areas of public health and medicine. So we're really well known for our School of Medicine, our School of uh, Public Health, especially in the last couple of years within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. But Hopkins is also home to a School for Advanced International Studies, a School for Nursing, the Peabody Music Conservatory, a number of different campuses all throughout the state of Maryland and really throughout the world that are doing a lot of really great work. When we're talking about the undergraduate student experience at Hopkins, we are specifically talking about the experience on the Homewood campus. For those of you all that are familiar, in our hometown of Baltimore, the Homewood campus is located in the northern part of the city. It's a 140-acre campus where all 5,300 of our undergraduate students live and learn in one of two schools. So when we talk about Hopkins as a university as far as undergraduate programs go, we're a mid-sized institution with about 5,300 undergraduate students. And we have over 50 different majors and 40 different minors or more than 40 different minors. And all of our programs are divided into the two schools that you all can see on your screen. So the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences and the Whiting School of Engineering. I know as you all were coming in, 
you all were sort of sharing in some information about some of the programs that you all were really interested in. So there was a lot of, you know, really strong interest in programs like science and engineering, computer science and technology, mathematics. Those are all really strong programs at the university. But with over 50 different majors, no matter what you might be interested in, whether it's something related to the STEM field or it's something like education, history or the social sciences, language arts, the humanities broadly, visual and performing arts, know that there's probably going to be a program that's available here at Hopkins. And no matter what you all are really interested in already or what those interests may be as you're sort of developing them, know that we give our students an incredible amount of freedom and flexibility. Like I said, in a lot of ways, our reputation precedes us when it comes to STEM-oriented programs, and we certainly are really strong when it comes to those programs, but know that at Hopkins, you are coming to be a technician in one specific area, but we really want our undergraduate students to be able to receive a well-rounded education that is really going to be able to prepare them to be adaptable no matter what challenges may come their way or what the future may hold. And in order to be able to do that, we really go back to really two important principles that really define our academic experience. First and foremost, we were founded as a nation's first research university. And in a lot of ways, everything that our students do is really meant, you know, is meant to be able to have a real world impact. Our students want to be able to make a change in the areas that they're really passionate about. But we also understand that in order to be successful in the real world, you have to be able to think about issues from multiple different perspectives and be able to have a depth of knowledge that you all can really call back on. So all of our students are able to benefit from the liberal arts foundation that our institution has. And when you sort of put these two together, it really does offer a really unique undergraduate experience. And so we'll learn a little bit more about research and how our students are actually putting what they're learning inside the classroom, uh, you know, to use to real world application. But to talk a little bit about the benefits of a liberal arts curriculum here at Hopkins, you know, we want our students to be able to have a lot of freedom and flexibility in order to be able to explore what they're already interested in and be able to discover new interests while being able to build really important skills. So when you all think about Hopkins as an institution, we have over 50 different majors and know that you can always declare what major you're interested in, but you'll have plenty of opportunities in your first couple of years to be able to really explore what you're interested in. We have an open curriculum, which means that there's no checklist of classes that you all have to take. I know that we have students that are really ranging in all sorts of different in, um, you know, stages of their K through 12 experience. We have some elementary schoolers, some middle schoolers, the majority of you all being high schoolers. And when you all think about what your academic experience has looked like within the classroom, for a lot of you all, you all have probably been told what classes to take, you know, given a few lists, of, an option and a short list of classes and being told that you have to take these classes. Know that at Hopkins, we're never gonna give you a checklist of classes that you have to take, but we give you the freedom and flexibility to be able to think broadly within specific areas like the humanities, like social sciences, like engineering, like the natural sciences. And we tell you that you have to take a certain number of classes in those areas, but you have complete control over what that looks like. That means that you can dive deeply as early as you want to in the things that you're really interested in. And if you ever want to take an academic risk, you're more than able to do that while being able to you know, have the security that you'll never have to feel like you're going to be able to fall behind in what you're interested in. And so know that that's something that is really great about the academic experience at Hopkins is that you have the opportunity to really fully engage in what your academic interests are. And in a lot of ways, you might discover new interests along the way. 60% of our students actually double major in different areas. So if they're finding new interests along the way or if they're coming to our campus with different interests, know that they're able to combine those and be able to really see all of those different interests that they have come to life at our university. And as you all will hear from our students in just a bit, this is completely unique to every single student. So while all of our students have the same level of flexibility, the same level of freedom, all of our students take advantage of those experiences in a number of different ways. In a lot of ways, that leads our students not only to think differently and ask questions that no one else is asking, but we also really encourage students to be able to find the answers to those questions. And so, like I mentioned, we were founded as a nation's first research university. And so if you're looking for an institution where you're able to not only ask really unique questions and connect the dots between different subject areas, but also be able to find the answers to those questions, then Hopkins can be a really great opportunity, a really great environment for you all as students. 
when you all think about what these applied experiences look like. Some of you all may be really passionate about really interested in research already, but know that that's not the only way in which you're able to see your interests come to life. There are plenty of opportunities for students to be able to take what they're learning inside of the classroom and apply it to a real world experience. 98% of our students are going to have some sort of experience in hands-on applied experiences before they graduate. For a lot of students, that's research. For a lot of students, that is internships or study abroad experiences. Whatever that might look like for you, know that that's going to be supported at our university. We've had students that have been able to uh, you know, design cryogenic technologies to treat breast cancer. We've had students that have been able to develop new techniques for kidney dialysis. We've had students that have been able to take advantage of the resources of the Hopkins Network, being able to handle rare books in our rare books collection, or being able to do research on the COVID-19 pandemic or other public health issues within our university's uh, sort of network. And these are all really great experiences where if you know that you want to do research, you're not only coming to the first research university in the world or uh, in the country, but you're also coming to the first place, you know, first as far as spending goes. So we have unparalleled resources for students to be able to pursue their own ideas, be able to do research with professors, be able to take advantage of everything that the university has to offer. If at you know a certain point you've been told that it's really important to do an internship while you're in college, know that you have plenty of opportunities for those as well. So we do have opportunities for students to be able to find internships. For some students, it could be at the local NPR station a few blocks down from campus or at the Baltimore Sun. It could be at places like Under Armour, T. Rowe Price. Know that there's lots of really great opportunities right in our own backyard in Baltimore, but you're not limited by those experiences. If you want to be able to gain professional experience as an undergraduate student, to really be able to get an edge in the career field that you're eventually looking to move on to, know that that's an opportunity that you have. And I think study abroad is also one that students at, in the K-12 can be really excited about. If being able to get hands-on experience as a romance language major means going to Spain and being able to study there, if it means that you want to be able to have exposure to a different way about thinking of engineering by studying you know, engineering in Denmark, or you want to be able to do a pre-med program in England, no matter what academic interests you may have, know that that's going to be fully supporting study abroad experiences as well. And this is all to say that, well, we could go on with the number of opportunities and resources that we have here at Hopkins. Hopkins is an institution where you're going to not only be able to learn everything that you want to be able to learn inside of the classroom, but you're going to have plenty of opportunities to be able to put that into real world use and have that mean something, have a really dynamic undergraduate experience. So you're not just learning about these issues, but you're able to really wrestle with them and really be able to take advantage of everything that Hopkins has to offer. Being such a large university network, we have a wealth of resources. And more likely than not, our students are always finding about different opportunities that are available at the university that they didn't know a semester or two semesters before. They're able to take advantage of it, of those experiences. And being that we have a dedicated undergraduate student experience, it means that you have this large world of opportunities available within a small school environment of only 5,300 undergraduate students. And so know that there's plenty of different ways to be able to have the academic interest that you all have probably pursued through CTY, really be able to come to life when you all are on our campus. Talking a bit about student life before we go ahead and hand it over to our students, know that there's also plenty of opportunities to be involved in the student experience as well. So while academics probably really excite you all and are the things that you all have sort of you know brought you all to Hopkins in a lot of ways, know that one thing that we always really emphasize is that when you are at Hopkins, you're not just here to be able to get good grades within class and learn that you know everything you want. That's definitely a really important part of the Hopkins experience. But as you are thinking about what a college experience could look like for you all, you also want to think about the fact that you'll not only be a student within a classroom, but also a community member within a broader community of other students that have their own diverse interests. If there are things that you all are really involved in at the high school level, at the middle school level, or even as an elementary school, that you know, you think to yourself, I really want to be involved in that. So it could be something like sports, it could be something like academic organizations, it could be something like social justice. Know that there's probably going to be an experience that lines up with those experiences at Hopkins. And every single college will tell you that they have lots of different clubs that our, their students can be a part of. And you can always start your own club if you want to be able to take that experience. But I think that 
thing that's really unique about the Hopkins experience as far as student life goes is that our students really take ownership of the experiences that they have here at the university. So we're an institution that's large enough to be able to have over 400 student clubs and organizations, but also small enough for students to be able to have meaningful leadership roles where they can gain that professional experience, where they can put uh, into action initiatives or ideas that they have and really be able to take ownership of the Hopkins experience. I think that as I think about the Hopkins experience as I've been here for the last four years now, I really do think that in a lot of ways, our campus wouldn't be the place that it is if we didn't have students that were ready to be a part of this active campus experience. And so that's something that I'm always really excited about. And I know our students would be more than happy to talk about as we're getting into the panel. When we talk about where we are, of course, within the city of Baltimore. So Baltimore is also a really great place for students to be. Know that the student life component of being a student at Hopkins doesn't end within the bounds of the Homewood campus, but our students are also really actively involved in wanting to be able to be a part of the Baltimore community. So while our students are connecting through the different organizations that we have, through the student involvement fair, through the many events that are going on, on our campus, I know just today we had an event to be able to celebrate on one of the quads a National First Generation College Student Day. So that was an event where lots of community members came out. But our students are also really involved within the city of Baltimore as well. Baltimore, as far as cities go, is a medium-sized city. So it offers all of the conveniences of being able to be in the city, while also being able to have a lot of opportunities for students to really be connected. In a lot of ways, the things that are on your right of the, uh, right right now on the screen are speaking to the things that you all could be involved in. So whether it is um, you know, parks, being a part of, you know, being able to take advantage of different museums, know that there's lots of things for our students to be able to do. But in a lot of ways, I think what's really unique about Baltimore is not only the fact that it has a lot of resources, but our students can really be fully engaged in the city. Like I mentioned, there are lots of organizations and companies that give our students opportunities to be involved and gain that professional experience. But our students are also really involved in the many different neighborhoods in the communities that we have here at Hopkins through uh, you know, public health education programs, social justice programs, tutoring initiatives, and our students are really embedded into the city and take ownership of what the Hopkins experience means for our students. And that all is to mean that there are going to be plenty of opportunities for students to be able to be a part of the different festivals that are going on, to be able to be a part of the different activities that are going on within the city. And no matter whether it's on campus or off campus, you're never gonna run out of things to do within the city of Baltimore and on our campus, which all really makes for a really you know, exciting student experience. I know that's a whirlwind of information to sort of get through and sort of lays the foundation for the conversation, but I do want to be able to have as much time as possible for our student panel. So if any of that piqued you all's interest and you're definitely interested in learning more, know that we'll leave this up uh, for just a bit for you all to be able to see some links and resources that you all can use to be able to continue to learn more about Hopkins, whether it's about the university itself or the admissions process. But with that said, I do want to go ahead and take this time to be able to have our panelists turn on their cameras and introduce themselves. So I'll ask our panelists to be able to share your name, your class year, your major, and then if you participated in the CTY program when you were in K through 12, you're more than welcome to share that. And then, like I said, our students that are tuning in, you all are more than welcome to use the Q&A to submit questions. But I do have a question that we'll go ahead and start off with after all four of our panelists have finished introducing themselves. You know, um, I think I remember everything. Um, so I'm Anne Marie Nolan. Um, I'm originally from near Annapolis, Maryland, um, and I'm majoring in molecular and cellular biology at Hopkins and um, in, at, in violin performance at Peabody through the Peabody Homewood Dual Degree Program. Um, I was a part of a couple of CTY programs in high school and middle school. I did a lot of their online classes um, in biology and chemistry and physics and math. Um, I also participated in the summer programs. I did one at Hopkins, um, I did genetics, and then I took epidemiology at Princeton. So I think, I think that's all the questions. I can go next. Um, I'm Shelby. I am currently a um, senior. I'm studying computer science and sociology. Um, at Hopkins, I went to CTY um, for a couple of summers at Hopkins and also in Saratoga Springs. 
Um, I took a mix of classes. I took logic, game theory, and a creative writing class. Um, was there anything else I needed to answer? Okay. All right, and then, uh, hi, my name's uh, Samuel. Um, I'm a sophomore uh, studying material science and engineering with a minor in energy. Um, I participated in quite a few CTY programs. I did some of the online um, like accelerated learning stuff, and I did uh, two summer programs, one at Franklin and Marshall, and then one at uh, here at Hopkins. All right, hi, I'm Harrison. I am originally from San Francisco, California. I am double majoring in biomedical engineering and psychology, and I'm minoring in marketing and communications and applied math and statistics. Um, and I did, oh, I'm a junior, and I did one CTY program in high school, and it was the pre calculus. It was pre calculus, yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourself. So it looks like we have had a good number of questions that have been submitted by students. So one of the first topics that we can go ahead and start off with that I think is um, top of mind and was asked in a few different questions. So there was a question around declaring a major or a minor, um, what that process actually looks like. Um, not only for admissions, but as you're sort of like transitioning to Hopkins. So I can answer the admissions part of the question. So there was a question that was asking if it helps to declare a major or a minor on your application up front, or if it's better to leave it undecided. Know that in our admissions process, we went through it very quickly, but every single student when they get to their senior year in high school is able to declare a first and a second choice major on their college application to Hopkins. That gives us a sense of what you're interested in. The only program that we admit directly into is biomedical engineering. So that's the only program that students have to declare up front when they're applying to the university and the only program that they have to be admitted directly into. If you all declare a major or don't declare a major, know that there's not an inherent advantage or disadvantage to one versus the other. But if you do declare a major, it can help us contextualize what we're seeing on your application as far as what your academic interest might be. So if we see that you're really interested in the natural sciences and you've pursued experience in the natural sciences, then that can help us make sense of your major. If out of you know nowhere one day you decide you wanna be able to major in German, you don't speak German at home, you've never taken a German class in your life, that isn't to say you're at disadvantage, but it can help us, it can sort of like raise questions for us. And so that is a little bit of the admissions piece. So every single student is able to declare a major if they want, not an advantage or disadvantage if they don't. Uh, and then biomedical engineering is the only major that they have to declare up front. But for you all as students, so some of you all may have declared your major and known exactly what you wanted to be able to do when you got to Hopkins. Some of you all have made, changed your major. I know some of you all are double majoring. So I was wondering if you all would be able to share a little bit about what your academic experience has been like taking advantage of the flexible and open curriculum at Hopkins and how much you feel like you've been able to benefit from that. I can start with this one. Um, so when I applied to Hopkins, I um, indicated that I was computer science. I had taken a course in high school um, and really enjoyed it. Um, but I also really liked history um, in high school as well as my science classes. So I was definitely like thinking about computer science, but not 100% set on it. Um, something that I really liked about Hopkins when I was applying was that like more open curriculum. So my freshman fall, I took five classes in five different departments. And that was when I took my first sociology class. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was, it was like all the aspects of history I liked in high school. Um, and then from there, I was able to like take more classes in the spring. Um, so yeah, that's how I came to computer science and sociology. I can add on to that. Um, I think coming into college, I knew I, so I, I'm pre-med, I would like to go to med school in the future. Um, and so coming into college, I kind of knew that that was where I wanted to end up. Um, but the great thing about being pre-med is you don't have any particular major you have to do. And so I wavered a little bit between what I, what exactly I wanted to focus on during my time here. Um, there's lots of different areas to pursue, like in the scientific field, you could do like public health or behavioral biology or molecular biology. Um, so I started out um, as behavioral bio, I took a couple classes, decided it wasn't exactly for me and switched to molecular and cellular biology. Um, but what I really wanted to add on to that is um, I kind of uh, came to Hopkins in part for the dual degree program because I really wanted to be able to combine my interest in violin 
um, and in molecular biology. And the program at Hopkins was something that I really couldn't pass up having the opportunity to study both at such a high level. Um, and so my academic experience in balancing the two has been something that I think is really unique to Hopkins. Yeah, so I came in for BME. So um, just as, as we said before, I had to apply for it specifically. Um, like you just submit that when you submit the application. So when you actually have to apply for, um, and then I got in for BME and that was like my major. Um, but like, just because I had one major doesn't mean I couldn't have more. Um, and yeah, I mean, the course load is so flexible that even with majors that have a lot of requirements, um, you can still add minors and add second majors. Um, so, I mean, I have like I mean, I have two majors and two minors and I'm going to graduate in four years and I don't have to take a lot of, I, mean, I don't have to take a crazy amount of classes. Um, and I actually just added a major or a minor yesterday. Um, so you can, even, you can like add stuff, you know, up until your senior year and, and there's no real, there's no real problem uh, as long as you can complete it. Uh, it's, it's very flexible. So if you find something you're interested in, you can always add it and, and take classes for it. Yeah, and just to add on briefly, like, I came in to Hopkins thinking that I really wanted to do pre-med and I came in as a public health major. And then like through my freshman year, I realized like, it's really not what I wanted to do. And the great thing about Hopkins is that like, you know, it's kind of thought of as like a very strong school for medical, like for pre-medical students, just because of our ties to the medical school. But there's so many other great programs that we have here so that like, you know, if you kind of decide that, you know, you want to do something else, you're able to switch into another program and, you know, still have a great time. All right. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. And there was a there were a couple of questions around research. So it looks like um, from the audience, there's a bit of concern of, um, or just like curiosity if you all were involved in research. Uh, when you all were in high school. So for some admissions clarification, like I mentioned, we were found as the nation's first research university, lots of opportunities for those experiences once students get at, to Hopkins. But as far as admissions go, there is by no means a requirement for research. If you all are ever interested in learning more about how our admissions process works, we do offer general information sessions where we go much more in depth into the admissions process. But one thing that we always talk about that we want our students that come to Hopkins to be able to exemplify is a research mindset or academic curiosity. So the curiosity that really exemplifies that whether that student or not has had research or not, that they would want to be engaged in these experiences and want to really be able to make the most of the Hopkins experience. And so know it's more of the characteristics of a researcher that we're looking for in our admissions process. So that academic curiosity, that willingness to ask questions, that inquisitiveness, those are things that we're looking for in our admissions process. So by no means a strict requirement that you have to have research. For our panelists, um, if you could quickly say whether or not you were involved in research at uh, the high school level, and then if you've been involved in research at Hopkins or another hands-on experience that you've been really proud of, you're more than welcome to share a little bit of that to be able to paint a more complete picture for our students. I can go. Um, I just typed something in the chat because it said like to end race, so I just answered it. But um, I think. Uh, no, I did not do any biology research in high school. Um, I had done a little bit of like computer science research through an internship at the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, from that, I knew computer science was not something I could see myself doing, so props to Shelby. Um, but uh, I had not done any biology research, but now having been at Hopkins, I have been involved in quite a lot of research. Um, through actually the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, um, I transitioned to a genomics lab that we have there. Um, and I also do research at the medical school um, at Hopkins as well. Um, so through that, I've been able to be involved in a lot of different um, research projects. And I think the great thing about research here is that um, it's not as if you're just doing busy work um, or, you know, random, you know, things that your PI doesn't want to do. Um, you're actually getting to contribute to projects in real life. A lot of my friends have papers published. Um, I have a friend who's like first author on two papers. Um, so, you know, really cutting edge things that you're doing, not just for the heck of it, but actually to contribute in a meaningful way. Um, so I did um, not do any research in high school. And then in college, I've done two internships over the summer, um, both at tech companies. Um, and then for the sociology major, there's like a research class component. Um, so in that class, I'm working with a professor on social protest um, research. And something I think I wanted to highlight about research is um, 
like I've never actively looked for research, but there's like so many opportunities that kind of like as a student, when you get to know your professors go to office hours, like they'll just like bring it up and just like ask, are you interested? Or if you go to office hours and you talk to professors about your interests, oftentimes they'll be like, are you interested? Because I have a colleague um, working on this, um, which I think has been really neat as an undergrad, um, like hearing about the different projects that are going on, especially a lot of them are interdisciplinary. I can go next. Um, so I did do research in high school. Um, I, I, I did research at a local university. Um, and I, yeah, and, and, and I, and I do, I still do research here. Um, I think it's always really funny when like people ask, like, if they need, they need to do research in high school to get in, because like, I mean, I think most people like, except like some exceptional case, exceptional cases, like the research you do in high school, like, isn't really like that that big of a deal like I know at least for me personally like the research I did was kind of a joke like it wasn't really legit research um, like you would have here um, and I think really like as long as you're like a engaged student with a research mindset in high school that's what matters more than actually have done have do, have, like, having done it um, because most people don't have access to research and, and you know I, I don't think like and those people are still you know like they like anybody can you know get in as long as you have that research mindset. Um, but I do I do research now. Um, I do I, I work at the um, medical school for two different research projects. One is clinical, so I actually am in the operating room and I'm doing um, systems analysis of medication errors, and then I also do administrative research, so understanding how administrators schedule people um, for the operating room, which sounds boring, but it's actually pretty interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can get involved in all kinds of research here. I think it's really important to, to remember that like STEM research is definitely like the one you're going to hear the most about, um, but you can get into all kinds of like you know, sociology research, like literature research, language research, and um, yeah, we have all kinds of opportunities for everything. Yeah, and then I had some research experience in high school. It wasn't even through university. It was just through my, through my high school, um, which was, I mean, it, it was okay, I guess. Um, I And it's nothing like the research that I do now in college. I mean, it was just kind of like more like busy work. And now I'm like really working in a real lab here on Homewood. Um, and like it, for getting involved in research here, you know, it's it's really, really easy. I know people who, you know, never did any research in high school and then, you know, sent some emails to Hopkins professors over the summer between senior year of high school and freshman year of college, and they were able to get a position in a research lab, you know, even before they stepped foot on campus, so without doing any research. So, you know, professors are super excited at getting people involved in research and, you know, even, and they're, they're always willing to, like, teach you all the skills necessary to work in the lab. All right, awesome, thank you all for sharing. And as far as statistics go, so I mentioned that 98% of our students will have some sort of hands-on experience. For students that are listening in, 80% of our students do research. So every single one of our panelists has had some sort of research experience here at Hopkins. Oftentimes I feel like there's a sense that research is competitive, but you all can see how readily available research is no matter what you might be interested in, what you want to be able to be engaged in. I did have another question that is related to not only research, but sort of navigating the university. I think Shelby, you sort of alluded to this in your conversations with professors, but I mentioned in our presentation, Hopkins, as far as the institution is a really big place, biggest private employer in the state of Maryland. And it can seem really overwhelming to try to navigate all the different resources that we have. Could you all speak a little bit about the different support services that you all have, that you all have taken advantage of, that you feel like have been really helpful while you've been here at Hopkins, to whether it's professors or staff members or like formal offices? I'll go first. So um, when you're here, uh, you get a bunch of advisors. You like every single major or minor that you have, you get another advisor. So, and then you also get your normal advisor for like just normal academic stuff within your school. Um, they're kind of like the administrator who just needs to like open up class registration and like approve some overload requests. They're not all that helpful, but your major advisors and minor advisors are super helpful. So I'm at four because we're, I, have, I have two majors and two minors. So I have like all of these people who I can go to for help. And sure, some of them are like more useful than others just because of like what I'm interested in. Um, but if I want to know more about the field or get in contact with, you know, potential employers or just learn more about research opportunities, uh, I have four people that I can go to 
and talk to about that stuff. And they're very open. They are not advising that many students. They have a lot of time for you. I think my biomedical engineering advisor has like five people that he's advising. So actually I'm meeting with him tomorrow to, to go over my class schedule um, because it's a requirement actually to, you have to meet with your advisors before they can let you register for classes. Um, and we're just gonna be talking about my goals, um, my, my, class, my class plan for the rest of my time here. Um, and I always feel very supported and safe with all those people who are, who are here to help me. I can go. I don't know if Shelby wanted to go, but <laughs> I can go. Uh, I think um, adding on to the advisor um, thing that Harrison was talking about, you definitely get a lot of advisors. Um, we also have um, for people interested in going to like pre-professional programs for law and for medicine, I don't have any experience with the law people, but I have a lot of experience with the pre-med advisors. Um, there's a whole office dedicated to helping you kind of figure out how to navigate that path because it can be a little bit tricky to figure out. And um, the advisors that I have met with have been wonderful. Um, and they're really there to help you um, figure out like what you need to do on your application, like how you can like make yourself the best possible like applicant to your future, you know, career or schools. Um, so pre-professional advising is another group of people that I think is really helpful. Um, I've also had really good experiences with quite a few professors. Um, I like to tell the story of like my freshman year chemistry professor. Um, I went to her office hours one time, asked her a question about, you know, whatever we had gone over in class that day. And we ended up talking about like her research and like what I was interested in. And then we started talking about like restaurants we both, both liked. So um, professors are like very interested in getting to know you. Um, there's another professor for a different class who over COVID um, had office hours every single day because for like varying, varying time so she could connect with people over many time zones. Um, so, you know, very, people are very open and very invested in getting to know you and helping you succeed. Um, as long as you, you know, kind of put in the effort to like meet them halfway, like, and, and seek out those experiences as well. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. Um, I think professors, I have had great experience going to their office hours. Um, but also a lot of classes will have CAs and TAs, I think, that are also there, um, especially if you have maybe more like content related questions and you don't feel at, um, super comfortable going to a professor. Um, I've had great experiences there as well. And then Hopkins also has a lot of resources for like general academic support. Um, we have like multiple programs. So I think that pilot, um, which is like a peer led um, like group academic or the learning den and then the study consulting. I think those are all student run. Is that correct? I think they're all student run and they're um, like, you'll be um, like paired with um, a student who's taken the class that you're currently taking or if our study consultants, like a general, like upperclassman. Um, but those are all really helpful as well. And they're offered for so many subjects. Um, and then the writing center is one that I use quite often. I write a lot of papers for my sociology classes and the writing center. Um, you can go in with a draft of your paper and they'll give you feedback um, and help you with that process. Looks like there are a few, so we have just under 20 minutes left until we reach the eight o'clock mark. So I will go ahead, it looks like there are a few admissions questions that I can go ahead and quickly address before we go ahead and get back into some of the more student-focused questions. If our panelists do see a question that's directed at them that you all want to go ahead and answer in the chat as well, you all are more than welcome to be able to do that. But to be able to answer a few of the admissions questions that are here. Uh, so one of the top questions was asking around admissions data and matriculation data for students that participate in the CTY. So know that that's not information that we disaggregate from our general admissions information in the university. So we wouldn't be able to provide a number, but generally students that participate in CTY are students that are exemplifying what we oftentimes in our admissions process would call academic character. As we're going through our admissions process, and this sort of speaks to some of the other questions that are in the chat, the reality of institutions like Hopkins is that being a highly selective institution, last year we had an admit rate of around 6%. We do get more academically qualified applicants than we have physical space for in our process every single year. So we had last year an admit rate of around 6% with 37,000 total applications, looking to bring in a freshman class of around 1,300 students. And a lot of students that we have to turn away are academically competitive. 
And so as we talk about in our admission sessions much more in depth, when we are reading applications to university, there is no magic formula that we can use to be able to put in statistics, put in numbers and get an instant admission decision. But every single applicant to the university is evaluated by an admissions committee that is looking not only at the academics a student has as far as test scores and grades go, but also academic characteristics. So we talked a bit about having that research mindset at the high school level, having academic curiosity. We want you all to not only be able to do well within the classes here at Hopkins, but also really be able to fully engage and also be a part of a really active community. So as we're going through our admissions process, know that our admissions committee does practice holistic review, which essentially means that anything and everything that you put on your application could be used. If there are things that you're really passionate about, if there's anything that's really been a pivotal part of your high school experience, whether it's been through the academic year or through the summers or as well or in middle school and elementary school, the big emphasis that I would say is for you all not to feel like there's a specific formula that you all have to fit, but to really pursue the things that you all are most interested in, really let that shine. As you're able to do that in, you know, to the best of your ability within the context of your high school, your community, those are the things that the admissions committee is really looking to be able to see. You know, we have four panels here that have really different experiences, not only where they're coming from, but their majors and how they've taken advantage of Hopkins. So there is no specific formula that we're looking for students to be able to, uh, you know, submit every sort of fit within every single year. But that gives you an idea of what our admissions process looks like. And again, we talk much more in depth in our admissions presentations about that, that we host daily, um, almost daily in the virtual space as well as on campus. As far as test scores go, um, last year, we will continue to be test optional through 2026. So for everyone currently in high school, we are test optional. And as we're sort of creeping towards later years, we will reevaluate that policy ahead of time. But at least through 2026, we are test optional. Last year, these are by no means hard set numbers, but the middle 50% range for the SAT last year is between 1520 and 1560 and 34 and 35. But again, we... Uh, do come deny students that are comfortably within that range. So we're looking at the entirety of our application for students to really get a sense of who might be the best fit for our admissions process. I will go ahead and answer some questions in the chat that are admissions related. But in the time that we do have, I do want to sort of uh, shift gears a little bit to talk a little bit more about you all's life outside of the classroom. So we talked a lot about academics. We've talked a bit about the research that you all are involved in. But I was wondering if you all could quickly share some of the ways that you're involved on campus uh, outside of academics and how you manage to be able to balance the time between your academics and your extracurricular commitments. I can go. Um, so I'm involved in quite a few things on campus. Um, I first and foremost, I guess what takes up a lot of my time is I'm an RA uh, for freshman students. Um, and I was an RA last year. Samuel was my resident last year. So um, that's fun. But um, so I'm an RA. I'm also the president of the Women's pre health Leadership Society. Um, I sorry, I have to pull up a list because I have quite a lot. Um, I do research at the medical school and at the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, I work as a medical assistant. Um, and I volunteer at the hospital as a violin teacher and as an ac ac academic tutor. So just three different volunteer things. I don't teach violin at the hospital. Um, but anyways, um, so I think balancing all of those and in addition to both of my majors has been um, quite challenging, um, but not in a bad way. I think um, I de definitely didn't start out at Hopkins doing all of those things. Um, I They kind of like gradually build as I, you know, have gained more confidence in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, and as I've, you know, kind of figured out like how best to to manage myself, uh, manage, you know, a schedule. Um, and so it's definitely not like as soon as you get to Hopkins, like you're in 9,000 different things. Like that's, that's not the case. Um, so I think balancing them all has really helped me learn how to, you know, manage my time really well. Um, it, that's also part of the reason why I came to Hopkins is because um, I wanted to go to a school where I could, you know, be part of two very different majors, um, be part of research and, um, you know, extracurricular activities um, and not have to give up one for the other. Um, and so, you know, having a planner has been my favorite thing because um, I basically, you know, live out of my planner. But um, I think that's my been my number one tip is just, you know, manage your time really well and you make time for the things that you love. And I love everything that I do. And so it doesn't feel like a chore because it isn't to me. That's remarkably similar to what I was gonna say. 
Um, I manage my time because one, I am attached to my planner. I write like everything, like every little thing I need to do in my planner and cross it off as I go. So that's my number one tip for like any um, student entering college. And then the other thing um, I was going to say for in terms of advice was to do things you enjoy. Um, and that really helps me with my time management to take classes I'm interested in, to participate um, in extracurriculars I'm interested in. Um, so with that being said, in addition to like giving tours and working with the admissions office and taking classes. I also um, am in a sorority at Hopkins and I'm part of a um, group called the Tutorial Project, um, which is like my favorite um, thing I've done at Hopkins. You're matched with a student um, from Baltimore and you are working with them for the entire semester twice a week. Um, and I worked with mine for um, two years now. So I think that's like a really cool program um, at Hopkins. It's through the Center of Social Concern. And I also um, TA for the computer science department, um, which I think is really interesting because it's um, like great to um, help students who are just like starting out um, with coding. So yeah, that's what I'm involved in. And uh, kind of what my experience is, is that I came in freshman year uh, and I tried to join like 25 different things. And then I realized that like, yeah, you don't have the time to do all of that, especially because like, you know, your academic stuff is pretty difficult and you need a lot of time to do that. And if you try to get involved in too much, you're going to end up, you know, spreading yourself so thin that you don't have time for anything really. And so I've, you know, over the past like spring semester and then this fall, I've really whittled it down to doing kind of the things that I really, really love, like enjoy the most and putting like all my time not all of my time, but you know, as much time as I can into those things. Like I'm involved in research. I'm a pilot leader, um, which is kind of a one of the tutoring services that we offer. Um, I'm on the uh, lion dance team, which is a pretty big commitment. But you know, these are all just things that I love doing, and I make time for them. Yeah. So um, I I just I agree with everybody said like get that planner and use it like time management is like probably the most important thing. Um, I'm also involved in a lot of things. Um, I am on the executive board for the Biomedical Engineering Society, which is like the student government for biomedical engineers. Um, I am a first year mentor, which is like an orientation guide. Um, and yeah, we, it's like for the full year, you like meet with your freshmen and, and you kind of help them get um, accustomed to campus for their first year. Um, I'm also a pilot leader. I am also a TA. Uh, for a intro to business class, um, which is super fun. Um, I, I want to go into teaching in the future. So um, that, that's that's really great. Um, I'm also on the handball team and I am in a fraternity. All right, awesome. Thank you all for sharing. And then I do have a question. You all can feel free to chime in if you all would like. I know that you all's experience has been a little bit different in terms of how long you've been able to be on campus because of COVID in the last couple of years. But students were also wondering, outside of the many hats you wear that, um, you know, on campus, if you all had to say, like, what one of your favorite things to do in Baltimore is, what would that be? I'll go first. Eat. It's eat. Um, it, it, there, there are there are a lot of good restaurants here. Um, and, yeah, my roommates and I, we do, we do a once per semester fancy dinner where we go to uh, an expensive restaurant in Baltimore and we all, like, we save up money for the semester and then we, we go and we celebrate the end of the semester. Um, and it's like out of all of our budgets normally, but that's why we only do it once per semester. It's really fun. Um, and it gives all of us an opportunity to try a new restaurant. Um, and I've had a lot of fun doing that. And, and I think there's a lot of great places to eat. Um, if you get outside of like the Hopkins bubble, which also has some good restaurants and, and good dining options. But if you get outside and you like really try different things, um, Baltimore is a really cool city with lots of different cultures and from that, lots of different foods, um, which is really great. I, um, okay. I really enjoyed exploring um, the different neighborhoods in Baltimore. And so um, the neighborhood really close to campus. Um, it's like five minutes from where I live, five minutes from campus, has a farmer's market every Saturday. Um, and so I go there and I try to get my produce for the week, um, just like walk around and see um, like a lot of what the local vendors have to, um, have to offer. And it's like very seasonal or it's, year round, but the vendors are seasonal. And so it's always a little bit different. Um, so that's been a highlight of um, like living in Baltimore. And then another one is, um, I guess, Pigtown. So that's where like the Orioles 
play. Um, and there's also a, a bunch of really cool stores there. I um, really like arts and crafts. And so there's like a secondhand um, art store there that I enjoy going to. And then a lot of my friends like baseball. So I'm also there um, quite often watching Orioles games. And um, Baltimore, at least to me, is like, it's really beautiful, especially like um, some of the parks that they have in the area. Like even just right by uh, Homewood, there's Wyman Park which I like to go running there all the time. Um, you know, we have Druid Hill Park on the, uh, near Hamden. Uh, these, are, these are just like places near the campus. But, um, you know, there's a lot of great parks in you know, either walking distance or you can take the bus there and I have to just go out there and uh, enjoy nature. Yeah, I have a hard time picking a favorite thing to do in Baltimore. Um, I feel like I'm always finding new and like fun things to do, even as a senior and even as someone who has grown up pretty close to Baltimore my whole life. Um, like I just went to Patterson Park for the first time like a couple weeks ago and I was like, this is the greatest place. Like, why have I not been here before? So like um, definitely always new things to do. Baltimore has a lot of cool like neighborhoods kind of. Um, so there's um, Shelby mentioned the farmer's market, um, which I think is called Waverly. Um, there's also Hamden, um, Fells Point, so all different kinds of places with kind of different flavors. Um, so there's definitely lots of cool places to enjoy. Um, so I really like exploring all of those. All right, awesome. Thank you all. It looks like we have about five minutes left. In the time that we do have left, it looks like we won't be able to get to every single question that's been submitted into the Q&A. So as we are starting to wrap up, I will bring back the slide with the information for all the different links. So to be able to walk you all through these different links if we're not able to get to your question. Our admissions website is on the top of the slide right here. So if ever you all want to attend an in-person or virtual session, you all can see the full slate of offerings that we have virtually for you all to be able to learn more about Hopkins, especially around admission sessions. If you all have more in-depth questions about the admissions process, we do have plenty of ways to be able to engage with us and our current students through our Instagram, our Blue Jay Connection portal, where you all can actually email uh, even some of the students that you all see on the panel right here. And if ever you have questions that you feel like the website can't answer, we are able to have you all connect with your current admissions counselor as you all are sort of navigating this college journey. So I know that it's a lot of information to take in a really short amount of time. An hour could seem like a really long time, but it really isn't. And as we are sort of closing out, I do have one last question that I want to be able to pose to our panelists. So we mentioned at the beginning that students are tuning into Hopkins, this presentation, learning more about Hopkins as a part of a college series where they're hearing about a lot of, you know, from a lot of different universities. And you all at this point are experts on Hopkins. You all know a lot more than you did when you were going through your own college search process about the university. So if you all could quickly in the time that we do have left, if you could sort of like talk to yourself when you were a senior in high school and as you were sort of going through the college search process, if you could mention like one really cool thing that you didn't know then about Hopkins to your previous self, what would that be? And that might be something that could be really exciting for students that are tuning in tonight. I can go and say, I kind of knew coming in, but I didn't really fully understand the level of amazing people that are here. Um, I think some of the people that I've met will hopefully be some of my friends for like the rest of my life. Um, but in addition to that are just some of the most well-rounded, most exciting people that I've ever had the honor of knowing. Um, you know, I have friends who are doing research and like XYZ thing, but also, you know, on a dance team or like, you know, whatever. Um, so everybody is so excited about their interests and so passionate, but also so kind and so helpful and willing to talk to you and hang out and just be a genuinely amazing person. Um, so I think that's what I would tell my high school self is like, be excited about the people you're gonna meet here because it's gonna be a blast. Um, something I guess I also kind of knew going in while well, I initially wanted to come to Hopkins because of the academic flexibility. Um, I think something that come, goes along with that, that I didn't think about um, all that much was like the other people in my classes are all in the classes because they want to be there, which like sounds kind of obvious, but I think um, that's something that I've really enjoyed because everyone is like there to learn, but everyone comes from different backgrounds um, because the curriculum is so open. Um, if you're like even slightly interested in something, you can take it. And then um, it's just led to like really meaningful discussions. Um, and just like meeting really cool people that you might not meet if you like, I don't know, have a lot of the same classes with certain people.
Um, I think it's definitely like the quality of the extracurricular activities um, in and around campus. Um, like, cause like, obviously, you know, the academics are going to be good. Like, come on. Like, yeah, that's like what we're like, that's what we're known for. Um, but I think it's really like another, the other half of college is what you do outside of your classes. And I think here at Hopkins, there are some really, really great opportunities to try new things, get involved in new things. And that's really cool. Like, I, I think there's a lot of focus on extracurriculars here and you can get involved in whatever way you want, um, be it, you know, multicultural organizations or service organizations or um, Greek life, there, there's, there's something for you. And people also like are very into, like the same way that people really care about their classes, people here also really care about their extracurriculars and they're very passionate about them. And I think that really makes going here uh, a better experience. Yeah, I'm not so far removed from high school, so I don't know if I had too much to say, but um, I guess one thing that I kind of surprised to like come here is at least like, you know, the diversity of just everybody here, you know, whether that be traditionally like, racial or ethnically, or just, you know, the diversity of thought that we have here, you know, even people in like STEM or pre-med programs are just, everybody's so different from each other, like, like, they're they're different and the same in some ways as in you know people share the same interests but those interests are divided amongst everybody like evenly so like everyone has like you know they they have different people to interact with they have different like connections that they can make with any different people and you know just like keep yourself open um and don't be afraid to just like do like do whatever you want just even even if you don't want to do something maybe you should try it and just see how it goes maybe you'll like it maybe you won't that's just how it is Well, I wanted to take this time to thank our um, admissions officer from Hopkins and our four former CTYers, our CTY alumni and four current Hopkins students for joining us this evening. This was very helpful and informational. And I want to also invite everyone back for our next session where we have uh, Sarah Lawrence, Carnegie Mellon and Muhlenberg College will be presenting. So please join us again. Juan, do you have any final words or are you gonna sign off? I will go ahead and just invite you all to continue to engage with us. I hope that you all get to see my face again, virtually or in person. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.